I would like to very warmly welcome everybody who is here in the room and everybody who is on the screen um, to this book presentation of the wonderful book by Nora Derbal, Charity in Saudi Arabia, Civil Society under Authoritarianism. And we have here um, on the podium, not only Nora, who will tell us something about her book, which looks like this. Um, well, I'm sorry, those on the screen probably can't see very much. Um, but I, I'm also very happy to welcome Dr. Elad Giladi, who is currently a Minerva postdoc fellow at ZMO, and Ms. Inken Wiese, who has a great expertise in um, well, in Gulf and charity. And please allow me to briefly introduce the speakers and then to hand over first to Nora for the presentation and then to Ilad and Inken Wiese. I won't say myself anything about the book, but let me just um, stress that it is based on the study in and fieldwork in Saudi Arabia and start by introducing Nora. Um, she's currently a research fellow at the Martin Buber Institute of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. But she has studied at Humboldt University and Freie Universität, as well as the King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. And between 2011 and 2017, she worked at the Berlin Graduate School Muslim Cultures and Societies um, on her PhD thesis from which this book is derived. And the book um, won the uh, Emerging Scholar Dissertation Award of Merit, an international society for third sector research, and came second in the German Dissertation Prize of the Kerber Foundation. Um, already during the final years of her research, Nora moved to Cairo and became a research associate and for a short time also the manager really of the uh, Cairo office of the Orient Institute in Istanbul. Between 2018 and 20, she then taught at American University of Cairo as an assistant professor and then moved in 2020, I believe, to her current position in Jerusalem. Besides books and articles emanating from the book, um, Nora has also published on youth culture, on scouting and women in uh, Saudi Arabia. She has a completely different current project, which is dealing with the exploits of a very colorful German explorer and Orientalist, Heinrich von Malzahn. Ilat Giladi is a, as I said, a Minerva Foundation postdoctoral fellow at ZMO and a future lecturer, or how is it called? Assistant professor, associate professor, all of the above, okay. <laughs> Assistant and Associate Professor at Haifa University. He obtained his PhD in Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies from the Hebrew University, and he has worked on Shia Islam, on Egyptian media and popular culture, in addition to writing a PhD on Saudi literature. And it is, in a sense, starting from this PhD that he's currently writing a book on the relations between countryside and city and the question of um, rural urban migration in Saudi Arabia as reflected in Saudi Arabian novels. And finally, last but not least, as they say, Inken Wiese studied Islamic studies, public international law and political science at FU Berlin and Cairo University, and then spent a year studying Islamic law at Harvard. She then moved to Constance University, where she is still pursuing a PhD in cultural anthropology about the Arab Gulf states as donors in development. And obviously here we have the close connection to the question of charity. In parallel, she has um, pursued probably more jobs than I even know of, um, among them working for the German Bundestag, being a consultant in development projects, teaching at the Hochschule des Bundes and many other things as well. She's also headed an association supporting the Willy Brandt Center in Jerusalem, which brings together emerging um, Israeli and Palestinian politicians, which in a sense perhaps it kind of closes the circle of this panel. 
I'd now like to hand over to Nora and thanks very much for agreeing to join this meeting today. Thank you very much um, for the um, for this introduction for the opportunity to talk about my book um, today here, which is really the first time I'm talking about this book in public uh, in person uh, since it came out this summer so i'm really thrilled to see some audience here. Um, so I, I was given 10 minutes or maximum 15 to talk about a project which really took 10 years <laughs> in coming out, um, so you see the challenge and. Um, I really want to stress that this book is the outcome of this book. I began thinking about the book or about this research project in 2009 when I was a visiting student at King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. And the Jeddah floods happened in November 2009, um, which had the effect that the university campus was flooded and there was no class. Um, and so I joined my fellow students to do some relief work. Um, um, with a number of organizations. And this is really how I stumbled into fieldwork. I um, was interested then in questions of charity because this whole mobilization that we saw happening in 2009 started with individuals collecting donations for those affected by the floods. And then I wrote my MA thesis um, in 2011 um, about charity in Jeddah, which was really a mapping of the field of charity and the number and the, the, the diversity of, um, of organizations that work under the banner of charity. And then um, I continued to work on the topic um, at the Berlin Graduate School Muslim Cultures and Societies, where I wrote my PhD thesis. And this time I concentrated really on charity for the poor. Um, I, I finished my fieldwork. I went back to Jeddah in 2012-2013 for all in all a year. Um, and so I finished my fieldwork before 2015. I submitted and defended my thesis, my PhD thesis in 2017, and already then I knew I had to go back um, because of these, because of the radical changes that we've seen happening since 2015. And one of the major um, changes that happened back then was the NGO law introduced in early 2015. And it was, I, I feel it was really significant that King Salman, upon ascending the throne, one of the first measures that, that he really took was first, um, he established the King Salman Center for Humanitarian Aid, um, which has become the major organization through which all donations um, that Saudis want to send abroad have to go since then. And I'm not going to talk about them, but I have an article on this overseas aid and how the 2015 uh, establishment of the King Salman Center has changed um, the flows of aid abroad. But here I want to really focus on the changes um, that 2015 brought about um, for domestic charities. Uh, so I returned to Saudi Arabia in 2019 for a short trip. And I realized that a short trip is not enough. So I returned again in 2020 on two trips. And this time I stayed in Riyadh with the King Faisal Center um, for Research and Islamic Studies from January until March with the short um, return to Cairo in February. So what, what I describe in the book is really this long trajectory uh, from 2009 until 2020. Um, and I do, in, in the book, I describe um, the events along two trajectories, as the title says in the book, and I'm going to circulate the book actually here in the room, so um, you can have a look at it. Um, so as the title says, it's charity in Saudi Arabia, civil society under authoritarianism. And in the title, you have the two trajectories. One is charity for the poor, and what I would describe as forms, of ev forms and practices of everyday Islam. And the other is the civil society under authoritarianism, or we could say politics from below. So let me say a few words on the first everyday Islam. Um, there are a lot of books that deal with Islam in Saudi Arabia, but they usually adopt um, a version of state Islam, or they, they deal with some sort of state Islam. And with state Islam, for example, I mean, in 2011, there was this fatwa which described forms of protest as un-Islamic, 
and basically ban demonstrations happening. And you have a number of articles that deal with that. Um, but here I would say the state instrumentalized Islam. Um, and this is what I, a form or a version of what I call state Islam. Other versions of state Islam are, for example, the judiciary, or um, um, if you look at the education sector, the segregation of men and women in public space. Um, but by contrast, I, I look at everyday forms of Islam, so how ordinary Saudis and non-Saudis in Saudi Arabia practice and interpret Islam. So when we look at state Islam, Saudi Islam is usually portrayed as radical and static. It is dominated by old men, um, the so-called religious establishment, the ulema, uh, and it is uncompromising. At least this is how it is portrayed. And I want to say it is portrayed like this, and there's wonderful scholarship coming out. I see here in the audience, Dominic Krell, and uh, we, can, we should all be very looking forward to his work, which challenges this notion of state Islam. But what I do, instead I look at everyday forms of Islam. And here I show that Islam is flexible. Um, it is subject to interpretation. And what, what I mean when I, when I say everyday Islam or forms of everyday Islam, this research really started with me asking charity organizations when they say they use the zakat for the poor and needy, what do they mean by this? Um, what do they understand as what, what, what kind of donations, first of all, um, do they have, do they receive, and to whom do they pass them on? How do they define the poor and needy? According to whom? Who is an authority on these questions? Who, who decides what to do with the donation and what not to do with the donation? Um, and one of the most surprising, or for me, one of the most surprising findings of my field work was really uh, the limited role of the religious establishment when it came to, to, to these questions. So when I interviewed within associations and organizations, uh, what they and I asked them, so how do you know what to do with the zakat? How do you define who's poor and who's needy and who deserves uh, um, assistance, what they did is they um, they went back to scripture. So social workers or heads of organizations, they would cite a verse from the Quran and they would interpret it immediately. And it is really this immediate and direct access to Islam, which I thought was most surprising. And here really you see the, the kind of fieldwork that I did was um, threefold. I did interviews and organizations. I collected texts, written texts, uh, flyers and brochures of these organizations. Uh, and I did some limited uh, participant observation, more or less participant, uh, a lot of observation. And here you really see that at the level of text, these organizations, they invoke certain fatawa, they refer to certain scholars, but when in, during interviews, my interviewees um, interpreted Islam and phrases of the Quran themselves. Um, so what, what I argue in the book is that um, in the field of charity, Islam really is, um, it's a worldly guide. And I was inspired here by the book Life Worlds of Islam by Muhammad Bamiya. Um, Islam functions as a worldly guide. Uh, it is a moral compass and some sort of ethical frame. And the strength of this moral compass really becomes visible where these values that the philanthropists find in Islam contradict with the values of the nation state. And because this is a book talk, I want to uh, read a passage from the book um, where I, from the introduction, where I write about this um, this moral compass. The strength of this moral compass is most visible in practices that challenge and compete with the values of the nation state. It is this moral compass that inspires social activists and philanthropists to creative adaptations. With its intention to please God, Islamic charity is at odds, it is often at odds, with the demands of the modern bureaucratic nation state which requires, for example, registration and monitoring of aid flows. Philanthropists claim that Islam 
their ultimate point of reference would command them to secrecy out of respect for the dignity of the beneficiaries. Whereas the Saudi nation state frames welfare as a privilege of citizenship, many charities continue to assist Saudi Arabia's poor and needy in this regard of their nationality. Many of my interlocutors stress the fact that they would not differentiate between a beneficiary with or without papers, so with or without an iqama, especially if this person is considered a fellow Muslim. In view of growing waves of nationalist populism, philanthropists and social workers continue to emphasize that Saudi Arabia is above all the land of Islam. The Islamic ethics of care mobilized by the philanthropist examined in this book rest on the notion of Islamic solidarity, Tadamun Islami, which invokes the idea of a more or less global Muslim community, the so-called Ummah, united in faith that worships the one God. A colleague in Riyadh told me, you call it civil society, we call it takaful ishtima'i, a concept we could translate as mutual social solidarity. Most Saudis understand that pilgrims to Mecca are guests of God, not of Saudi Arabia or any other nation state. This, according to many philanthropists, leaves those who for numerous reasons decide to overstay the Hajj visa and whom the state considers illegal in an ethical limbo. At the end of the day, they argue that Muslims are welcome to stay in the land of Islam. Islamically speaking, they are entitled to live on the land of Islam. Islamically speaking, they are not illegal. Okay, but having said this, I should emphasize that not all of the organizations that I discuss in the book were established in the name of Islam, and some distance themselves and are highly critical of what they describe as traditional Islamic charity. Instead, they emphasize that they uh, do development aid and they um, want to empower the beneficiaries. Okay, so this is one trajectory which I follow in the book, the role um, of Islam in aid. And the other is um, the question of civil society and politics from below. Because when I started interviewing and I asked questions about charity, um, many of my interlocutors responded by saying, this is what we do, it's not charity, it's development. And they emphasize that they see themselves as part of a Saudi civil society. And this was particularly pronounced in 2009 in the wake of the Jeddah floods. Um, so what I, what I argue in the book is when it comes to questions of civil society, we should um, look at the function of activism rather than um, stick to the form or to the lack of the form that as we know it in Western democratic states. Um, and I'm, I'm not the first one to do so. We see Jessie Moritz now, she came with us in the audience and I'm thrilled you're here. Um, because other people have for, for some time argued that some, some kind of civil society exists in the Gulf states. And I think this book really brings together um, this scholarship and um, feeds it with empirical evidence from uh, the charity scene in Jeddah. Um, so when I say charity is a form of politics from below, I emphasize that these groups and organizations that I study um, they engage for change. I call it charity for change. Change, or you could argue social reform. And they address, for example, topics like housing for the poor, uh, housing for uh, female-headed households, uh, for women who have no um, male legal guardian or who do not want to, st uh, to stay with a male legal guardian um, because of domestic violence or other issues. Because um, the husband uh, left and they don't know where he is uh, and they need someone to provide for them. Um, but it, these organizations, they also engage in topics like access for uh, access to financial services uh, for women, um, employment, training. Um, of course, you could argue this kind of activism does not address the wider political system. Um, none of the groups that I study um, engages in efforts to, to change Saudi Arabia into some sort of democracy. And uh, instead, one of them, I would argue, is quite pro-regime, pro um, the Majid Society, which uh, I study uh, in, in chapter three of the book. 
uh, it was established by a royal. And I think by following this organization in depth, uh, what I try to show is that really these notions of patronage and the state and what we understand as this hardy state, it's really a complex issue. So by adopting this bottom-up perspective on state society relations, I show that the state, the Saudi state, as much as Saudi society is diverse, the Saudi state uh, is also not this one entity with this one uh, regime agenda. Instead, I argue that we have to understand the state at least at three levels. One is the regime, which I would um, narrow down as the decision-making uh, head of state, um, the circle of power. And then you have the royal family. And the royal family nowadays, the dynasty consists of, I think, something around 15,000 members. And being a, a royal doesn't automatically mean um, these individuals have any political influence. Um, and I, I follow uh, a number of organizations established by royals who struggle, for example, to register. And this is where I argue that there is this third la layer, which is the bureaucratic state, which has become increasingly uh, influential um, and, and strong by itself. But then you have these three levels, but I would argue that even within that, there are different voices. For example, the bureaucratic state, I follow um, one employee at the Ministry of Social Affairs who uh, when I started out my research in 2009, he was actually a member of an organization um, that did research on charities. Then he worked for some time at a charity organization. And when I returned in 2020, he was an employee um, at the ministry. And he sometimes had quite um, divergent views from other employees in the ministry uh, who were tasked with implementing the changes brought about by the 2015 NGO law. So when we see the 2000, and I'm, this is the final point that I want to make, when we look at the effects of the 2015 NGO law, and when we adopt this long trajectory from 2009 to 2010, we see that some of the developments are actually uh, not as radical, the ruptures are not as radical as one might think. Still in 2020, the field of charity consisted of informal and formal organizations, those registered with the state and those who, uh, who engage in a legal gray zone. And you still have these diverse views that I would say are characteristic of the field of charity in Saudi Arabia. And I leave it with that and look forward to, to your comments and thoughts on the book. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nora, for this. Um... For this wide-ranging introduction, I immediately hand over to Elad, perhaps, um, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you Ulrike, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us uh, here and uh, via Zoom. It is my honor and pleasure to be here today as part of this panel to discuss uh, Nora's book, Charity in Saudi Arabia. Now, as a discussant, as not, uh, not as a, a reviewer or a, 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 or a critic, uh, I'm not going to, to talk about how much this book is uh, interesting and well-written and uh, innovative and important, although it deserves all the superlatives and more, uh, might I add. Uh, what I am going to talk about is how this book relates to my research about social and cultural change in Saudi Arabia and the shifting notions of identity and gender through the prism of the Saudi novel. Since I don't have much time, I'm going to focus on two points, and if I have more time, maybe two and a half or three points. So beginning with the first one, this book presents a different perspective uh, from which to view and understand Saudi Arabian society, not from a top-down vantage point of how the state plans and controls complex social and political situation, uh, but a bottom-up uh, from the point of view of uh, on-the-ground civil society initiatives and the ways uh, they act and react in the face of diverse social events, governmental power and politics. Uh, literature, and especially the novel uh, genre, 
can provide us with a bottom-up perspective as well, uh, so I claim. Aside from being works of art, many Saudi novels address the reality in which they are set and discuss a wide variety of subjects connected to Saudi society. Uh, novels are an important platform for, dis uh, for discussing social issues, uh, amplifying suppressed voices, and conveying social criticism and protest. Let's take the issue of poverty, for example. As Nora writes in her book, despite enormous riches from the country's outstanding natural resources, poverty is a growing phenomenon among some of the inhabitants of the kingdom. Few countries in the world experience a disparity in wealth as extreme as, uh, as that which exists in Saudi Arabia. The book deals uh, with such, such questions as how can the poor, how can there be poor in Saudi Arabia, what are the reasons for the growing pauperization among specific segments of society, and so on and so forth. The book shows uh, that wealth sharing and rent distribution were always non-egalitarian in Saudi Arabia and have excluded diverse groups of society, namely uh, Saudis living in rural areas, rural migrants, two urban centers, and of course, Saudi women. In short, all those uh, without access to uh, channels of resource distribution. Saudi literature gives us uh, another perspective on this subject. Um, this is, for example, one of the main themes in the novel Mudun Ta'akul al -Ushk. This one, uh, this novel is Mudun Ta'akul al -Ushk, Cities Eating Grass from 1998 by Saudi writer Abdul Khal. The novel tells the story of a migrant from a southern village who gets devoured by the uh, big city of Jeddah. And it highlights the enormous socio-economical gaps within the different groups of the city. This is also the main theme of another uh, famous novel by Abdul Khal, uh, Tarmi Bishararen from uh, 2007, uh, it can be translated as uh, Throwing Sparks. Uh, this novel, Tarmi Bishararen, uh, for which Abdul Khal received the International Prize for Arabic Fiction, also known as the Arabic Booker, uh, deals with the corrupting impact of limitless wealth on Saudi society. The novel takes place in Jeddah, where a luxurious palace is built along the shorefront next to a poverty-streaking neighborhood. Uh, Khal says that with this novel, with Tarmi Bisharar, he sees himself as the voice of those who are deprived of their rights. As I see it, he says, uh, the disenfranchised are those people in society who are not able to make themselves heard. My novel, he says, is an, an altercation between two worlds, that of decadent wealth and that of bitter poverty. But not all, uh, not all uh, Saudi novels, of course, reflect and deliver such uh, reflect reality and deliver such harsh criticism as, as this novel or these novels. Uh, and this, which leads me to my second point. When I started, uh, when I started reading uh, Nora's book, I immediately thought about how this subject, the subject of charity in Saudi Arabia, is represented in the Saudi novel. Uh, and two, uh, two examples, two, two novels uh, came to mind. Uh, and there are quite different examples from the, the ones I've just uh, spoken about and uh, very interesting uh, as I see it. Uh, the first one is a novel called La Asha Qalbi, uh, There is No Longer Life in My Heart uh, from 1989 by Saudi writer Amal Shatta, which tells of several women who live together in uh, Ribat, a sort of asylum or shelter for poor elderly and or forsaken women in Mecca. And not in Jeddah, unfortunately, but uh, close enough. Uh, each of the characters has her own story, but a common theme is class inequality between husband and wife and its tragic effects on the marriage. Uh, the women portrayed in the novel are all noble and altruistic, uh, despite their tragic fate and are willing to sacrifice their happiness and everything basically for the men in their lives. This novel does not, unfortunately, address the harsh reality of the inhabitants of these rebats, the majority of whom uh, are women, which Nora deals with in her book. In chapter two, Nora uh, writes, over the course of the 20th century, shelters have emerged as an alternative home for single women and female-headed families 
who found themselves marginalized by the legal and social norms of state and society in Saudi Arabia. Typical stories of the inhabitants of shelters describe women who fled from abusive husbands and were not welcomed back into their families, but equally struggled to make a living without their guardian. So instead of, in, of addressing this burning issue of these burning issues, the novel of Amal Shatta, one of the most prominent uh, uh, Saudi women authors in the, in the 80s, deals extensively with the theme of the self-sacrificing woman. And basically, Shatta's novel and, and all her novels, basically, seem to embrace the hegemonic patriarchal discourse about the ideal Saudi woman and take, uh, and take very conservative views on gender issues. So this example, uh, as I see, it highlights the gap that exists sometimes between novels and reality, or to be exact, between novels that align with the discourse of the regime and novels that challenge this discourse or simply try to uh, reflect reality. Another novel, another example, uh, that relates to the sub subject of uh, charity is a very interesting uh, novel called La Lamia Od Huluman. No, it's no longer a dream, by author Fuad Sadiq Mufti. Uh, the focus of, of this novel is a Saudi woman named Huda, who becomes a famous fashion designer in Rome and then returns to Saudi Arabia to open a fashion house of her own. After great success, uh, she, opens, uh, she soon opens several branches all over the Arab world, but at the height of her career, at the height of her success, Uda senses that something is missing from her life. Wanna guess what? Me? A husband. A husband. <laughs> Pretty much the same. Um, and she realizes that she has been suppressing um, uh, her feelings for Ahmad, the son of her business partner. So in order to appear more attractive and more feminine to Ahmad, she transfers the management of the company to her brother, begins attending various social activities for women, and joins a charity in Jeddah. So uh, seeing her after this transformation, Ahmad feels that she has become more beautiful and that her th uh, toughness, which had intimidated him in the past, has vanished. So the two get married and live happily ever after. So charity in this novel uh, is portrayed as a clearly feminine domain and like some sort of hobby for women of the Saudi elite, just as uh, described uh, more or less uh, by Soraya al-Turki's uh, famous ethnography women in uh, Saudi Arabia. However, uh, Nora's book opens a, a, a much wider perspective on this issue. Uh, so the oil boom, uh, catapulted Saudi families into a situation where they could afford to do without additional income earned by women. Uh, this allowed average families to keep their women confined to their private home and uh, thus limiting uh, their social life considerably. However, women associations emerged as a legitimate space outside the home for women to socialize. And over time, charity work, much like literature, has become a space in which Saudi women could actively negotiate gender boundaries. For example, the women engaged in welfare organizations were also fighting for girls' education. In the summer of 1962, a group of Saudi women raised their voices through a series of articles published in Saudi daily newspapers in support of girls' education. Among the authors was Samira Khashoggi, uh, not the mother of, but the uh, aunt of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, and she, she was the director of El Nahda Society, the first women's welfare association that was established in Riyadh. And not surprisingly, the same Samira Khashoggi was also the pioneer of women's writing in Saudi Arabia, who published her first novel, Wada'atu Amali, as early as 1958. Um, and she would have won the title. Okay, so enough about Samira Khashoggi. And now for my third point, uh, which I'm going to make half a point. Uh, so my third point was supposed to be about uh, the changes in Islamic discourse over time within the different charity organizations in accordance with uh, the changing zeitgeist and with shifting regime policies. 
So the other side of this equation is the way that the Saudi regime uses women uh, and the woman question as a tool for projecting a certain image of itself, mainly uh, to the West. So I'm just going to jump uh, to the end and uh, forward the um, kind of question to, to, to Nora. Uh, so in the era of, of King Salman, uh, one can say that civil society has become an important facet in representing the kingdom as a modern, neoliberal and post-Wahhabi state. And here I would like to ask uh, Nora, uh, um, is it working? So how is it perceived internally and externally, and especially in the field of, of, uh, of charity or in the field of, of uh, now NGOs in, uh, or NPOs in Saudi Arabia? And to conclude, I would just like to say that one of the most important achievements of Nora's book, as I see it, and I would also like to uh, hear what Nora thinks about it, is that it challenges the orientalistic assumption that, rep that repression is inevitably needed to pursue reform. The vibrancy of the, Saudi, uh, of the Saudis discussed in this book attests to their readiness to imagine alternative political systems in which free speech, civil society, gender equality, and above all, civil state can develop in their own homeland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ilad. And I think we'll spare our um, clapping for um, after the next comment, uh, which is by Inken Wiese. Well, thank you very much. And let me start by saying how happy and honored I am to be part of this book presentation. And that is for several re reasons, which I will outline in my short intervention. Um, but for time reasons, let me also say that I will focus on two points in this intervention. One is on methodology and field research as an anthropologist, um, and the other one deals with the fluidity and practices of Islamic charity as highlighted in Noah's book. And uh, yes, I'm a discussion too, but I will actually stress how well written and innovative this <laughs> book is throughout my intervention, and you will see why I come to that conclusion. So I'm happy to um, be at this book presentation because this book is the intellectual and material and product um, of your, as I may say, very wise decision early on in your PhD project to focus on Islamic charity in Saudi Arabia, because um, as I, if I remember correctly, there was a phase in the very, very beginning where you thought about studying Islamic charity elsewhere in another country, in a European country. And I remember um, my feeling of almost despair then of your decision to not to focus on, not to continue focusing on Saudi Arabia, because I had the impression that all this access that you already successfully um, established in Saudi Arabia, and in the book you mentioned couch, couch surfing and, um, and the royal princesses that you had met during your MA study. So I had this impression that all this unique access would go unused at a time when other researchers in the Gulf region, like myself, were struggling to get even much lesser access. So. Um, I'm happy that you chose the field, um, but I'm also happy that you were able um, to actually finish uh, that research, uh, and I will come to that in a second. But uh, having already touched upon the difficulties of establishing access in Gulf regions, let me say that I think that this book is rather a must read for students of anthropology in the Gulf region or other social sciences in the region who consider undertaking field research in a Gulf country. You highlight almost en passant in the different chapters the various tactics that you had to use to establish rapport and to, you know, social, to use social Wester of a certain kind um, that you needed to get a foot into the door of the organizations that you anal analyze. And, um, that might sound familiar to many researchers working in Arab countries, but as somebody who has worked in various countries, plus the Gulf, especially the smaller Gulf countries for more than a decade now, I dare may say that the situation in, in those Gulf countries for field researchers and for social scientists may be even a bit more challenging than in other places of the Arab world. And that is partly because um, several issues are considered political or a matter of 
national safety and therefore um, uh, well uh, raise the interest also of uh, national authorities and I can come up with a number of uh, researchers who have not been unable to finish their research because they've been arrested, sentenced, deported, barred from re-entry to GCC countries. And so um, that's why I say I'm happy that you were able to finish uh, your, um, uh, your research. Um, and your remarks on methodology and access and the various sources you relied on and that you interpreted and you mentioned some of them before highlight very clearly that when doing research in the Gulf region, you have to be willing to grasp any straw that is made available to you and that you maybe sometimes have to change your perspective or your direction and not follow uh, what you have planned at home or discussed with your supervisor early on, uh, which is, of course, um, a risk when you undertake a PhD uh, project um, that is supposed to be finished within a given time frame. Um, so it is our good fortune that you maybe happen to do that research at a time when Saudi Arabia experienced a certain openness towards foreigners, um, which, as you lay out in the book, was also a time when additional regulations and limitations occurred to your, um, to your interlocutors. So that was an ambivalent time. Um, and I was, I'm wondering, maybe similar to El Ad, what advice you would give to future, uh, for future research on Saudi Arabia, future researchers on Saudi Arabia, on the background of the experience that you have in getting access, etc. Um, this access enabled you to include a lot of voices of local Saudi interlocutors, and these voices, I think, are the major contribution um, of not the only one, of course, your study makes to the literature on Islamic development and charity and NGOs in the Gulf region, at least in the literature on um, on that region, on charity in that region, I find, and maybe not only on charity, on, um, I find those local voices more often than not rather missing. And that is true also in a certain sense for my own research, which, as you mentioned, is on international organization, no, on Emirati, Qatari, and Kuwaiti organizations working on international development. Because especially in the UAE and Qatar, the majority of my interlocutors were foreigners like myself who work for those organizations. Um, and while those foreigners uh, certainly do provide an emic perspective uh, of a particular kind, I, as well as other people researching the smaller Gulf countries, frequently point out that um, expert interlocutors often do not feel at ease to share sensitive insights into their work with outsiders, even when we, we as the interview partners, promise them anonymity. Um, so in contrast to that, Nora's book is full of astonishingly open, self-reflective, and even critical comments made by her interlocutors and partners. And through that, the book not only provides insights into the charity scene of uh, Jidda, but also engages critically with a multiple multitude of other social challenges that are prevalent in Saudi Arabia today. And we've mentioned poverty, unemployment, women, etc. So readers, and we pass the book around, who simply look at the table of contents should not be mistaken. This book is far more than four case studies on the four organizations, but um, uh, Nora really beautifully combines the, the, her insights into the work of the, and approaches and concepts and strategies of those organizations with the issues they tackle and the role of these issues in social policy and in state society relations in Saudi Arabia. And so the book can really be read as an introduction into contemporary Saudi Arabia's social realities uh, and how social issues are negotiated within the society, but also between society and the state or civil society as the state, however you divide those different spheres. And hopefully this is, a, this is a, an aspect which we come back to in the discussion. Um, and let me just mention that briefly, 
I felt reminded of so many debates and issues and phenomena that we discuss here in Germany while reading through the book um, that whoever uh, has no prior knowledge uh, of Saudi Arabia and, and reads through the book certainly lets go of any concept of exceptionalism, of Saudi exceptionalism uh, when encountering many of the, of the issues that you cover. And just one example, this issue of um, unproductive families and how to turn those unproductive families into productive members of the society and of the kingdom very strongly resembles debates we have here in Germany on, for example, Hobbes Fear families. So talking about Saudi exceptionalism, m many of that resonates, I think, also with the German audience. Um, but let me go back uh, to your research and come to the, the, the second point, which is the fluidity of practices and discourses of Islamic charity that you mentioned already, and you show how century old concepts and practices are adapted, transformed, translated to meet current day needs and circumstances of Saudi Arabia. And this as such should not come as a surprise to anybody familiar with Islamic charity, because we have seen this kind of fluidity and transformation and translation to everyday needs already in medieval times. And we know that many concepts of Islamic charity are themselves translated, transformed uh, formats of charity that were existent on the Arab Peninsula at the time. Yet beyond stressing this fluidity as such, the book sheds light on how concretely, by, by, man, by, by using those local voices, how concretely those local concepts and practices in Jeddah are merged with tools and ideas and discourses that Jeddah charity practitioners encountered elsewhere. And this elsewhere you describe very vividly as being in multiple spheres and places, be it in widely available translated literature of self-help by mainly US authors, the internet, YouTube videos, ideas that people took from their university studies in, in Saudi universities, but also during their studies abroad, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, so the book really beautifully shows how those existing practices that were perceived as Islamic are not simply replaced or discarded of, but how the new and the old practices, concepts, and ideas actually enter into a dialogue and sometimes synergism with each other. And um, by starting with the first uh, women's association in the 1960s, uh, you show that this process is actually constant and probably never ending. Um, and even in the more recent initiatives, references to Islam are still, still very much present, for example, as a tool, as you argue, for communication that resonates with both donors, beneficiaries, and volunteers. Um, but I think we would be wrong to assume that language and terminology of Islamic charity is used merely for tactical reasons. And here I would like to recommend especially chapter three that you mentioned already on the, Maz on the Majid Society, which claims to be doing development and not charity, indeed a sentence that I myself have heard several times uh, in, in my research as well. And many of the strategies that you did, uh, describe of the Majid Society seem to be inspired by neoliberal thought and concept from maybe more the corporate sphere. However, there's literature, for example, from Egypt, Muna Atiyah, Building a House in Heaven, uh, that shows um, how this ne neoliberal thought has actually been quite, has quite successfully entered the pious charity scene in Egypt and how values of efficiency and productivity are portrayed, in fact, as part of the mission and the message of Islam um, by those charities and are therefore actually not perceived at all anymore as non-Islamic or non-charity. Uh, and I think, and I'll finish with that, that quite similarly, it seems important to your interlocutors to explain how their initiatives and their concepts and ideas and strategies have grown naturally from their experience of having been raised 
and socialized in Saudi Arabia and of coming to terms with what it means to be Saudi and what it means to be Muslim. Um, and for many of your interlocutors, a driving motive actually seems to be the wish to be a productive member of that Saudi society. And civil society and charity engagement is their contribution uh, to making the Saudi society and state a better place. And this, again, may not be so different from civil society engagement, philanthropy, et cetera, volunteering that we see here uh, in Germany. So um, as for Saudi Arabia, and to finish with that, although you're careful to stress that your findings are limited to Jeddah, I think there's actually much ground to believe that youth and activists in other Saudi provinces are similarly shaped and affected by the same debates um, and ideas as those uh, ideas obviously travel regionally and globally uh, and i guess all of them would be hard pressed to tell where those already implemented ideas and ideas that they work with came from originally but they're perceived as as local by now um, so with that let me finish by saying that I look forward to the discussion, uh, to your comments and answers to our questions, and hopefully more bilateral exchange in the future. Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you very much, Elad and um, Inken. I would suggest that Nora gives a very brief response, perhaps, or answer to one or two of the points. You don't need to engage with everything that was said, um, as it was so very rich and it really added also a lot of new material. And that we then very quickly turn to the audience, because the first um, question has already arrived in the chat. And to the audience, um, you can write your questions in the chat or you can raise your electronic hands. Please don't try to raise your proper hands because I might not actually see you because you might be on the second screen. So, um, but first, Nora, briefly, and then we'll turn to the questions. So thank you for your wonderful comments and really, and also for pointing out the novels, which I didn't know. I think it really, this really, points out that this discourse on poverty and pauperization in within the kingdom is something is a phenomena that has occupied Saudi society for quite some time and I think that is really important when we discuss today's development with this emphasis on vision 2030 um, because this need for economic transformation is not something that that came about in 2015 uh, already in 2005, King Abdullah announced the war against poverty. And you point out that novels already address the issue of poverty in the 1980s. Um, so does civil society work to portray this new Saudi state in the wake of Vision 2030 as modern and liberal and uh, less Wahhabi or not Wahhabi? Um, I, I speak about that in 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 the last chapter where I engage with Vision 2030 and where an employee again at the Ministry of Social Affairs tells me, I ask him exactly that question and he says no. And they, they know it because the state, like the bureaucratic state knows it because what they say is as long as we do not have um, civil society organizations that uh, engage in human rights, as long as we do not have a human rights discourse within civil society, um, the West, the international community, is not buying that anything is changing here on the ground. And this, this pushes actors, the state is in this, um, in this trap because it needs civil society to critically engage with itself, which it doesn't allow. And there is much awareness of this trap. And this I really um, is a point that I would like to highlight. Um, because it, again, it speaks to the diversity of, of people within um, state apparatuses and also the diversity of voices within civil society, because there is a debate nowadays on how far civil society, despite all this emphasis of Vision 2030 in, in pushing a lively society and making Saudis active, um, that it has actually had quite detrimental effects. Um, and there are many Saudis nowadays who doubt that civil society is still active and can actually exist 
um, within such a repressive um, state. And we have seen uh, what happened to the women driving activists, for example, Jamal Khashoggi. And these, um, these um, events really sent shockwaves through um, civil society in Saudi Arabia. But again, let me emphasize, just because it is nowadays not visible and maybe mute, at times, it seems mute or invisible. It still exists. These organizations that I follow on the ground, some of them continue to, to, to do their work um, out of outside of the spotlight. One advice that I would give to researchers or to future researchers, because I see student, students in um, uh, online following us here, I think um, there's two things. One is don't give up and try to be as creative as Saudis are. Uh, this is really, I think, something that we can learn um, from engaging with Saudis. And the other thing is really the, the value of personal networks cannot be overestimated. When I um, returned for fieldwork for my PhD thesis, I did so with, um, with a permit um, to do research, um, a permit by the Ministry of Higher Education, which was signed by the minister at the time himself in ink, his signature, but it turned out that this permit caused so much um, misunderstanding and mistrust that whenever I took out the permit and I showed it to an organization and I said, I'm here and I'm, I have a permit to do research, <laughs> then they turned away because they thought, uh, they thought all kinds of things, but it really it, it proved a hindrance. So I refrained from showing the permit um, and instead, <laughs> instead went through local, through networks, through friends of friends of friends. Inken put me in touch with the trainer um, who was at the time a visiting fellow at the King Khaled Foundation in Riyadh. And this foundation organized um, workshops which brought together civil society activists from all over the country and their um, through networks I established during these workshops, I could then go back and, you know, snowball method to make a long story short. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Nora. Um, I think this point about the research permits you should write to everybody who tries to bureaucratize research more and more by demanding research permits and then written permission by interlocutors for um, actually taking notes or recording their um, statements, because I think it proves the point many anthropologists and many researchers on non-Western societies have been trying to make, that you cannot bureaucratize research in this way without actually causing exactly the kind of effects um, you have been describing. I think this is actually a super important point. Now, I have obviously many questions, but um, let me immediately turn to the audience who has been very patient. And the first question here comes from Claudia Graue, who sadly cannot be here and says her microphone doesn't work. So she asked me to read. First of all, congratulations, Nora, on your book. What a great achievement. And now my question. Is the charity that you described really aiming at reform, or is it just providing a certain service within the system, thus stabilizing it rather than causing it to change? Um, and let me just check if the question ends here or just my screen. Um, yeah, that's the question. So again, I would like to highlight that within the field of charity that I describe, different organizations and groups have very different agendas. Some, like the Majid Society, push for change, but with change, what they mean is a different version of the status quo. Others are more radical in their claims. And I think this is really important to understand. There are those who really push for reform in the sense and who address really critical issues. And I, in, the, in the book, I raised the question, what do we consider political? And when do we start to talk about engagement or describe engagement as political? And I think I mean, you can ask this question in any context. You can ask in how far vegans are making a political statement by not eating meat or the feminist movement that started with saying the personal is political. Um, and the same goes in Saudi Arabia. You have organizations that would never openly talk about the political system, 
but what but they push for change for societal change so i think at the moment where an organization or a civil society organization um aims to change societal structures i'd describe there i would argue that this form of engagement um, qualifies as political okay i don't see any questions coming from the screen and i really would like to also encourage our online audience to engage and not just to be the passive listeners but meanwhile in the room uh, graf von strachwitz who's a great uh, specialist obviously on charities and not just in the theoretical way um, would like to contribute um, yes thank you i'm rupert strachwitz from the Messinata institute i have two observations a request and a question um, Number one observation is thank you and congratulations. It's really, it's really extraordinarily interesting what, what we've just been hearing. My second observation, based on the fact that I'm a political scientist and I'm not in any way a specialist in Oriental or Islamic studies, my field of study being um, civil society studies, philanthropy studies, I was struck by the similarities in many ways between what you describe for Saudi Arabia and what we have here in, in Europe. Um, conflicts between the state and um, charities, especially at a sort of grassroots level, we have exactly the same thing uh, here. Um, the interplay is complex, is complicated, exactly the same the conceptual change from from charity to development that is a big big discussion that's been going on in in europe for a very long time so um and and of course the the, the last story you told about the, about the the permit i mean there, there would certainly be many german grassroots civil society groups who would react exactly the same if somebody arrived with a minister's permit, you know, say, you would say, out here yeah, immediately, you know, I mean, so, um, so th that really is extraordinarily interesting. And so my request is to, to, to someone to take this up and to unpack this sort of notion of uh, a state or region or culture related concept and see where the where the similarities are um, and uh, in, a, in a sort of comparative way. I think, I think that would be an extraordinarily interesting um, um, a bit of research to be done. And it would teach us quite a lot about this whole idea of the nation state, uh, which after all is not an anthropological constant. It's a, it's a, it's a 16th century concept and, and it's on the way out. Um, and that leads me to my to my question. Um, as I have learned, not least from Udo, um, Saudi Arabia is in a big transition towards a sort of nation state. It's all about the nation rather than religion or something. If I'm if I if I'm correct, what does that do to the relationship with civil society? Are we going to get into a similar contested civic space uh, um, sort of situation that we have in all kinds of other regions of this world? Uh, is it in fact going to be more difficult? Um, well, I mean, at first thought, one might, one might say, okay, if, if this very specific form of, of Saudi Islam, if that sort of fades away a bit, it might be easier. No, my, my, my sort of point would be, is it perhaps going to be much more difficult because the nation state, or the sort of dated concept in a way, but that's from what I learned, that's what's happening at the moment. If that gets underway, it's going to be even more complicated. So I'll use my prerogative as a chair to add to this very big question, a much tinier one, which goes exactly in that direction of Saudi as a an even more radical nation state and also as one which is regulating more. You mentioned at the very beginning how the King Salman Center is now channeling all the foreign aid through one particular organization. And of course, with the regulation, with the introduction of, um, 
of uh, I, I don't even, I've forgotten how it's called even um, one of the mat, uh, I mean uh, certain types of associations are becoming legal or have have become legal but that of course goes hand in glove with more regulation and already at the time when you were doing your research I remember how some organizations were saying well we we are actually not allowed to serve non-Saudi citizens and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't but first of all many of them are actually supported and sometimes also financed by the state so it's pretty tricky to go to circumvent this and with the increased regulation how does this play out do you have any idea from your last visit and as I said it's only a small question but adding on immediately so what I see is that these effects um, that that started happening in 2015 um, with the change of leadership and King Salman's ascension to the throne, the NGO law, is that things really have become tougher for um, nonprofit organizations on the ground, which is so ironic because Vision 2030 sets out to support um, the NGO sector. Um, and to, 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 I think one of the slogans that they have is um, to reach 1 million volunteers by 2030 in Saudi Arabia. Now, why, why has it become more difficult? One of the issues is, as you point out, that the Saudi state, the nation state, wants to see aid going to Saudi citizens. So one of the organizations that I interviewed, that I started interviewing in 2009, 2010, the first women's welfare association at the time in 2010 in an interview the head of the organization back then told me that when they started um, the work in the early 1960s the majority of their beneficiaries were non-saudis by 2010 already she at the time assumed around 70 percent of their beneficiaries were saudis and when i returned to the organization in 2020 uh, and i asked the same question um, they told me that they are only supporting Saudis and no non-Saudis, no matter if they have proper papers, iqama or not, it doesn't matter. They, the state demands that aid goes to Saudi citizens. Now, when we look at those non-registered organizations that still exist, they still continue to direct, as I, as I said before, because they understand that Islamically speaking, aid, the, aid is not tied to citizenship, um, they continue these informal organizations and initiatives to give aid to non-Saudis in Saudi Arabia. And this, um, this includes, for example, those who were born in the kingdom, and you have those who, who even their parents have been born in, in the kingdom, but they do not have Saudi citizenship because it is actually quite difficult um, for non-Saudis to get um, citizenship. Um, and so you have a large number of people in the country who have no place to go to because already their parents were born in the kingdom or have come to the kingdom. They were born and raised in Saudi Arabia. They speak Arabic as their first um, language, but they have no citizenship. And so life for them becomes very hard. And they are one of the major groups of beneficiaries by, um, that receive aid by these organizations or by these initiatives, I mean, some of what is happening nowadays, um, because it has been, things have become harder for um, non-registered organizations, is that many of these initiatives have become even more fluid, have become even more spontaneous in the way they organize um, aid. Um, and the last point I want to say here um. is the, um, the this, what you, what you say, um, Rupert, about charity being somewhat a universal phenomena, I want to stress this point because I really think philanthropy, it's one of the few phenomena of humankind um, over different cultures, regions, throughout time um, that we see exists with many surprising similarities. Um, and this is why one, this is why, first of all, I chose to work on charity, but the other reason is I chose to work on charity within the frame of civil society, because I think this allows for a comparative perspective. Because you might you might ask, civil society is such an outdated concept, because what we've been doing for some years or decades is actually criticize the frame and readapting it. 
Um, and it seemed already outdated in the 1980s. And then the, the so-called Arab Spring or the Arab uprisings happened. And, and again, scholars questioned the use of the concept civil society because the mobilizations that we, that we saw came from actors who were not even at the time considered part of civil society. But I think still, if we go back to this frame and adapt it and critically think through it, it allows us to compare what is happening in Saudi Arabia with other authoritarian states, with China, with Russia, or um, with European countries, with Romania, um, with Germany, for example. And I think this is really, um, it's really time to, to do so and stop exceptionalizing Middle Eastern countries, Islamic societies, um, and the Gulf in particular. We now have three questions from the from the virtual audience. Um, first, Jonathan Benthol, who will speak himself, and then I have two questions in the chat. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hi, yes. Jonathan. You can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Well, congratulations, Nora, on this wonderful book, and not least for its sure-footed sure moral and political integrity. Uh, it occurs to me that Palestinian Islamic charities have been interpreted as embodying the quality, the virtue of samud or, or steadfastness, as opposed to violent opposition. Do you think that this idea could be at all applicable to the Saudi case, particularly since the accession of of um, King Salman and, and increased authoritarianism? Uh, or if not, do you think you might have found it if you'd been looking for it as a, um, as a, a, a virtue to be, to, be, to be found among these um, charitable actors? Shall I reply immediately? Mm -hmm. So I, I think this the idea of smooth the the steadfastness the not giving up despite difficult circumstances there are elements that we that i would say we see in saudi arabia but i think the difficulty that i have with this concept is that it really assumes that there is an opponent and i think what i've learned in my field work is that many saudis see the the state the saudi state much less critical than we do uh, here for example now um, in let's say the German political uh, elite or the Western elite. I, I think this, um, what, I mean, some, some Saudis are highly critical of the authoritarian structures, but others are not. And I think this is really the diversity that I wanted to together with the voices that I brought together in that book. Because when I um, interviewed in 2012-13, Many Saudis, for example, and this is just one example that I want to give here, many Saudis followed the uprisings very closely in the region um, and were wondering if, if something similar would at some point happen in Saudi Arabia. But when I went and returned in 2019 already, 2020, many Saudis then spoke with great relief of the fact that Saudi Arabia had not seen such uprisings in 2011. And I think this idea that, um, that civil society is naturally somewhat opposed to the state is something that I want to challenge because you have organizations that um, are in fact trying to support the status quo, but a different version of the status quo, as I, as I said before. And I think we really have to rid ourselves of, of this understanding that civil society is automatically opposed and pro-democratic pro um, for, for that matter. And what I, when, I, when I think of Palestinian resistance under um, the banner or the motto of Sumud, I think it is really highlighting the fact that um, these Palestinian organizations are, um, are very much opposed to the Israeli state, no matter what, and they hold on to this resistance. Thank you. Um, I'm now reading the question by Peter Enz Harlas. 
How do these organizations in Jeddah view the more political, Islamically inspired civil society activism in the 2000s and early 2010s, like that of NGOs like Hazm or informal groups like the so-called Jeddah reformers, Saud al-Hashimi, etc., who focused on political reforms and human rights? Are there continuities between today's charities and the political activism of the 2000s and 2010s, or is today's activism purely unpolitical? So there, there were overlaps in, um, in terms of people and interests and the debates. And I think at the time, these organizations that you point out, they were part of, um, of a scene. I, I think what we really saw during King Abdullah's reign was a time, it was a great opening already during the, the years 2000. And there was much debate um, going on. Um, and nowadays, not. So when, when you ask me, is there political activism of that nature, of that sort happening nowadays, I would say, no, there, it's not possible. But, and for example, I highlight how um, those actors or some journalists, intellectuals, um, social activists, have been high, who have been highly critical of Vision 2030 because of its lack of um, of acknowledgement of Saudi Arabia's poor. So in a way, Vision 2030 is a step back, they say, because in 2005, King Abdullah was able to openly um, not only speak about the poor, but he went himself on foot in this um, famous, famous moment. I think it was in 2005 when he went to a poor Riyadh neighborhood uh, on foot, unescorted, only with a lot of journalists, and it was broadcasted all over the kingdom. Um, that was the kind of openness that Saudis knew from the previous leadership. And nowadays, uh, speaking of poverty and the poor in Saudi Arabia has really be become again a taboo, um, to the, and which sometimes takes really really funny moves then, because people speak of the low income category meaning the poor. And I, I point to an interview where then the interviewer and the crown prince are talking about the low income category, uh, rather than talking of Saudi Arabia's poor, which just, I'm not saying that the state or the leadership or the crown prince in that instance, they do not recognize that Saudi Arabia has a problem with poverty, quite the contrary, which is why we see Vision 2030. Um, but talking about it and being critical of um, steps taken by the state has been pretty much impossible today. But I would say that still political activism is possible, but often the kind of nature where these activists and groups, they do not stage themselves or frame their activism as political activism. The red lines have become even more pronounced and they are do not address the political system, do not criticize the royal family, do not criticize the leadership, and above all, do not criticize Vision 2030. But if, let's say, if you stick to those um, rules of the game, then activism on the ground is still possible, and groups still, still do that, I would argue. Um. Iris Glosemeyer, hi Iris, nice to see you, um, sends the following question. Thank you all for the great presentations. Nora mentioned that Saudi charities often understand their work as developmental. Nora, could you please explain how they define the term development and what, and development of what, society, question mark. Um, so I have this quote in the book where I ask the same question, how do you define development then? And then, um, my interlocutor said development is the bridge uh, between society um, and they emphasize so when when I asked this question about development and um, to Saudi civil society activists what they what I see is that there is a lot of reflection um, and every one has their own ways of understanding and there's really an engagement with ideas of development with ideas of empowerment um it there is not just this one version of development which everyone tries to implement but there is really a, a, a very a lively discourse there happening and a lively debate how to best support 
the poor in their development. And one, I think what most people, so highlighting this diversity, I think what we can see is there is a trend towards human development, Tanmiya Basharia, and an emphasis on um, training and capacity building um, with all its, um, with all its traps and difficulties, but this is really the direction that I see many initiatives try to implement. And they do so sometimes also from uh, an Islamic perspective. So instead of, they are those who just say, don't give a poor man a fish, teach him how to fish. But then there are those who, um, who recited to me a hadith, for example, where a poor beggar approached the Prophet Muhammad and he said, um, what do you have? And the poor beggar said, I have nothing except this ball with which I, um, with which I'm coming to you. And then the prophet said, give me that bag. I give you, um, I give you some money and with that money go and buy, um, buy a tool. And then, so the story goes on and on. And at the end of the day, it has the same message. The Prophet Muhammad teaches the poor to be self, self sufficient and self reliant and how to support himself with his own means, rather than just give him something out of beneficence or out of goodwill. Um, so you see that this, this notion of development is really goes in all areas, it is not only those Western um, liberal minded or Western oriented Saudis who, who follow this approach, it can also come from very conservative, very Islamic circles. It really goes throughout uh, all kinds of layers of society. Thank you very much. Um, are there more questions? Yeah, Sebastian Zons. Thank you so much, Nora, uh, for this very inspiring presentation. I'm looking forward to read the book. Uh, so far, I didn't do so, but I will. Uh, and thank you also uh, for the for the other presentations. Um, you have mentioned uh, productivity and, and the term uh, of, of productivity in, uh, with regards to, to charitable work. Um, do you see a trend in the last couple of years, specifically after 2015, that charitable philanthropic work has become more professionalized in order to get more productive so that it is also kind of a business opportunity um, uh, for specific uh, Saudi people that there is a kind of a connection between uh, working in the philanthropic sector but also to be more productive in an economic related sense because that is also part of the vision 2030 to, uh, to, be, to make Saudi Arabia attractive for business uh, uh, to make it a hub for economy is this is this let's say trend also playing out in 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 the charitable field so to say so maybe it's uh, it was too early five year, like four years after the um, the announcement of Vision 2030 when I finished my fieldwork in 2020, maybe it was too early to to really see this um, relation. Where I saw it, where I saw the closest overlap between ideas uh, brought forward in Vision 2030 and the the charity scene was in the sector of tourism, where I now saw uh, organizations who were training the poor to. Um, fulfill certain positions, certain jobs that the tourism industry needs uh, in the service sector, for example. Um, so this is the closest overlap. But these like training initiatives have existed before. Um, and it wasn't quite clear to me at the time and how far these training programs were successful. I think it was too early to, um, to really see that. Since I don't see any questions, I at least would like to draw attention to one thing which I think in many ways underlines what you have been said about it becoming more and more difficult to address the, that they are poor in Saudi Arabia and um, that, you know, this is somehow a problem. Um, the, I've been following the, the social media discussions about the destruction of, the, of all the older quarters in Jeddah. 
And what is really pronounced there is that basically all those who live there are more or less in a generalized way considered not only to be immigrants and thereby almost by nature criminals, but also, um, you know, as basically more or less worthless. Um, so that, you know, it's just fantastic. We are demolishing all of that and Malaysia, if nobody knows what's going to happen um, to these people, but also in general to, to these areas, it will be modern, it will be developed. But what is happening to the poverty, to the problems um, that perhaps existed in these quarters, etc., is no longer anything that needs to be dealt with because we just demolish it, we abolish it. Um, so I, I think that in, is a very stark way by the state to express this. And I think it's good to see that there are still societies and associations and many people, of course, who see this differently and try to, in some ways, counter that kind of um, rather cruel um, approach to poverty. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I can only second that. Um, the, I think it is more difficult than before for most of the organizations that I follow to, to do their work, but what I really want to stress is that they don't give up. And so I think there's, there's always reason for, for hope. Um, they continue to navigate and do, um, do a job as best as they can. And they, what, what I think is really wonderful about, um, about Saudi society and what we, I think we can really learn from Saudis is being creative in that regard and not to give up and pursue uh, their aims um, and different strategies. Well, I think um, this, uh you know, last word of hope is really a very good way of concluding this discussion. Many thanks to you, Nora, for writing the book, of course, but also for this nice uh, presentation and discussion. Many thanks to the wonderful comments by Elad and Inken, and many thanks to all those who in the room and outside of it um, stayed with us to follow this discussion. And I hope many of you feel encouraged to engage with this book, which came out this year with Cambridge University Press. Thank you very much. Thank you.